Well, in that case, yeah, I do apologise for the uh, for the bit of a delay. That was a few technical issues, and I'll blame it on my motorbike because that's uh, that's always a good thing to do. But um, yeah, good to see so many people here. Um, yeah, might, might as well get into it, I guess. So Boas has obviously started off the series with one with a seminar on batteries. Um, I'll be covering a little bit more on the overview uh, on EVs. Um, some of this information is probably, uh, you know, a lot of people will know it already, but hopefully I can go into a bit more detail on individual components and then that will hopefully be of some use. And if it's not use for anyone here, then hopefully it's for use for the lecture capture. So, uh, okay, so quick introduction, because uh, I guess, well, it's been a while since I've been here and maybe not everyone knows who I am. So. Just to uh, just to make sure that I'm not some random guy coming in to give a random lecture without any uh, anyone knowing. So yeah, uh, I'm Renz Bosses, as you probably saw on the first slide, um, and I left Warwick uh, well last year. So I was uh, been involved with Warwick Racing since kind of year one, all the way up to my final year. Uh, I did five years in total, one year being an integrated year, and um, yeah, co-led the team in uh, 2000. 20 to 21 so we had the uh well we one essentially going a competition and currently i'm employed at soyeta so that's a electric drives company in uh, vista so um yeah a little bit i suppose on the series as well the idea is mainly to well as i kind of previously alluded to this is more of an overview and then we'll be doing a few more lectures on the uh, individual components so um to start with nice simple diagram of a lovely ev they're very popular these days um we obviously need a few building blocks uh to get them to work you'll recognize a lot of these maybe in slightly different form than what we have at the moment in the what it cars but um but yeah typically evs can be broken down into kind of five components obviously there's a lot of stuff in it in initially that's uh, that's going on in the background but if you look at if you break it down into the core um, the core functionality, you're looking at these kind of five parts. So we've got an inverter. Um, well, I suppose we we'll start with the battery pack because that's already the most obvious one. Um, in normal EVs, this is normally in the floor. Obviously, in uh, in our vehicles, it's in a slightly different place. Uh, we've got the inverter in the loop as well. That's converting DC to AC current for the motor. Um, then we've got the electric motor obviously you can have many different configurations and you know people put two motors in people put four motors in single motors um whatever you want really um the slightly more maybe, well maybe less obvious one is the vcu so uh for evs this is essentially doing what a ecu would do on a car but uh, because of the way that you're uh, driving the ev and how you want to generate torque demands um the VCU is a bit more responsible for uh, safety systems as well compared to ECUs in typical IC cars. Um, and a random component of interest, I suppose, the onboard charger. Um, so obviously, uh, electric cars can be designed with any kind of DC voltage uh, in the battery pack. So um, a lot of the time, people have integrated onboard chargers as well uh, to make sure that you can actually, you know, you can charge for your car from the 240 AC coming out the wall um, and that's then converting it to whatever battery pack voltage you require. So um, yeah again this is not really a very important slide it's more just to say that EV manufacturers really like their long abbreviations so if you ever see any of these free so BEVs, PEVs, HEVs just be aware it refers to a type of uh, powertrain so battery, electric vehicle, that's obviously the, um, that's the core, that's the, the uh, well, the typical EV, if you will, where you have a full battery pack, so you don't have any traction power generated from um, IC engines at all, all the way up to HEVs, which are um, kind of more of a hybrid system. So for instance, they might use an electric motor to, ex to do initial acceleration and then uh, switch to IC engines to, uh, to for instance, uh, keep it going full speed it's a bit more efficient that way um yeah and i kind of mentioned before we can obviously have this these components in any configuration uh front motors back motors whatever you want really uh, but that's same as normal cars so i won't cover that in too much detail so let's uh, go into a bit of detail on the battery pack um obviously boas did a very good job 
covering this already, so I'm not going to spend too long on this. Um, but from a very basic perspective, um, the battery pack is obviously one of the critical parts for EVs because that contains all the energy. Um, the DC link voltage uh, that is normally, uh, well, that is desired, can be achieved by putting cells in series. So if you put cells in series, you can increase the voltage of your chain. If you put them in parallel, you increase the current delivery um, of your, uh, well, of the battery pack, really. Uh, and uh, yeah, just to give an idea of scale, obviously, uh, well, typical cars like to get the mileage out. So we need big battery packs, uh, just to give a example there, you know, looking about 8,000 cells uh, for a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack. That's a lot of cells to package into a small area and uh, yeah, all the problems that come with that. So just to uh, go from the, from, the, uh, from the basics really, I'm sure a lot of you know this already, so I won't dwell on it too long, but uh, your typical cell can obviously be in various diff different forms. So uh, this is a cylindrical cell. You can have, uh, you know, pouch cells, you can have prismatic cells. Um, cylindrical cells are quite common because they're easy to make and they're tried and proven. So uh, and that's commonly used in Teslas these days, but obviously many other, uh, yeah, many other uh, architectures exist. So for battery packs and cells, this is a very common terminology, the 1S, 2, 1P. So that refers to how many cells you've got in series and how many cells you've got in parallel. So with one cell, we've got one in series, one in parallel. So that the notation is common, 1S, 1P. If we move to a slightly bigger unit for that, we move on to modules. Um, so this is where you essentially take your cell, you package it into a particular format in whatever is convenient for your drivetrain. Um, and then you start to combine the cells to essentially break down, break them down into easier to handle blocks um, because obviously you need to package 8,000 of them into a small area. So, um, so yeah, for example, this is obviously just highly dependent on what you want your configuration to be. So this particular one at the, at the, uh, at the front is a 10S2P. So what that means is we've just got 10 cells in series there and then we've got two parallel chains. So um, essentially that whole module, if you will, is at the same DC link voltage, but we are doubling our current capacity uh, that can be delivered by the cells. Um, and yeah, so obviously got infinite options there. So we've got a 7S1P module there and the 5S2P module as well. This is then combined into a pack, uh, which is uh, essentially where you put all your blocks together. So obviously this is on a much smaller scale compared to an actual EV battery pack, but that's kind of the idea. So uh, yeah, that's the uh, that's how that's done in industry. So um, yeah, just to give a bit of an idea on what that looks like in practice, uh, this is a uh, Tesla battery pack that uh, someone online decided to take apart, and take the roof off. Obviously not endorsed by Tesla whatsoever, but that's uh, that's no fun, is it? So um, yeah, you can. This particular pack is a um, well, it's a 310 volt nominal pack voltage. So and that's quite a few cells in series. Uh, and then you can clearly recognize the modular structure in that it's got uh, 16 modules which are laid out um, in their common shape. And obviously having them, having them in this modular format means that it's easy to manufacture, easy to put together. And um, yeah, it just really helps, well, in this case, Tesla's uh, manufacturing chain. So uh, a lot of the time, if a battery pack fails, you'll get a failure in one particular cell or a row of cells. So in that case, you can actually find out which module has failed and then swap out that particular module. Uh, so then you can still use the rest of the pack. Um, so yeah, this particular, I don't want to dwell on it too much again, but, uh, but yeah, these ones are 5.3 kilowatt hours each. So that's a reasonable amount. And they're only about 20 volt nominal, uh, 22 volt nominal. So uh, they're easy to handle and they're not as dangerous for uh, people to injure themselves with if they decide to start licking terminals. That's, uh, yeah, a bit less uh, dangerous there. Uh, yeah, so this particular pack has some interesting features. Um, so a um, very common, common. Um, well, I suppose one of, the, one of the tricky things with cells is that they're not perfect. So uh, whenever you're trying to draw current out of a cell, um, each cell has got some internal resistance. So essentially that's kind of 
the crux as to why you need a good cooling system because uh, every time you draw a bit of current out of that cell the internal resistance is causing a power loss across that cell and um, yeah obviously the higher your internal resistance the worse your uh, your power loss and that power is converted straight into heat so uh, obviously if you're pulling full current out of a cell for a very long period of time that's um, going to cause quite a lot of heat there so uh, that's why the cooling design is one of the critical things in battery packs so um, yeah it's essentially trying to take that heat away for any means possible so that can be through liquid cooling uh, phase change materials are common as well where essentially they um, they heat up and then they deform which uh, takes up a bit of energy there um, Boas covered this in much better detail, but yeah, there's obviously a lot of safety features. So there's contactors, which are essentially switches to enable your DC link. And then you've also got fuses in a lot of different areas in the pack. So in this particular pack, we've got fusing at cell level as well. So the top image is just uh, is a, it's an image where they've, um, how they've joined individual cells and modules together. And you can see that the wires joining the cell to the actual bus bar are very thin. So that's designed for the maximum um well essentially if you're pulling more current out than that wire can take then that then that fusible link will will blow so that will isolate any dodgy cells from the rest of your uh, module so that's quite a common uh, safety feature with uh, cylindrical cells um in that they try and set them up in that way um yeah the other thing is uh, obviously battery packs need a way to um make sure that they don't catch fire so that's typically done using a battery monitoring system which is really just trying to capture the voltages of the cell and the temperatures in the pack as well, because that's obviously two indications which you can use to protect your cells from uh, over voltage, under voltage, over discharge, that kind of thing. But uh, it's a topic for another day. Oh, that was the wrong button. There we go, that's more like it. Okay, so electric motors, that's a bit more fun. Uh, that's basically what I've been working on over the last year. Um, it's a little bit more mystery behind it as well, I think, in terms of how they actually work. So, um, does anyone, can anyone give me a benefit of electric motors compared to ICE? Efficiency. Yes, indeed. Yeah, anyone else? Basically instant torque. Yeah, instant torque, exactly. And that's kind of two of the main key points why, uh, why electric motors are so, well, are so desirable in a way. So uh, as you mentioned, we've got full torque available from zero RPM. So um, that really means that you don't need to care about where your power band lies as much. With typical IC engines, it's, um, yeah, that's really how you need to design your gearbox because you always want to stay in a particular RPM band. With, with uh, electric motors, it's basically just full torque from the get the go. And uh, that means that a lot of EVs these days are, well, essentially auto. They're really boring to drive, but it's uh, good for uh, good for your power to weight ratio um, yeah that means you also need a lot less ancillaries compared to a normal IC car so um, you know you need much less pumps you don't need any any timing belts any any cooling well, any advanced cooling systems so um, you know your actual power density of an electric powertrain is a lot higher compared to IC and uh, as mentioned you've got a very high efficiency uh, which is uh, easily well much more easily achieved with electric motors compared to um, compared to typical IC engines so just to put that into a, a graph uh, or give that in graphical format so um, as shown the one on the left is for a typical electric motor um, I will say that typical electric motor refers to a PMAC motor in this case but uh, the idea is the same in that we've got full torque available from the start which is the line in blue and then only at after a certain RPM, that's when we start to drop off on the torque that we can produce. But uh, at that point, we, um, well, at that point, we essentially enter the constant power region. So uh, electric motor graphs are kind of divided in constant torque, constant power, and then high speed regions as well. Uh, but obviously when you're designing your EV, you want to ideally design it in the, um, in the, uh, yeah, the constant torque region. So you've got full torque available for your, entire speed range that you're designing the vehicle for and uh, yeah you kind of see that disadvantage on typical IC engines obviously it's not this is not a uh, an actual power curve from that I've tested myself but that's generally what they look like so you've got this kind of optimal 
um, torque band essentially. So in this case, that lies around um, 1800 RPM to say, well, what should we call it? 4,000, 5,000 RPM. So uh, you really want to design your engine to be, to be operating in that region most of the time. Uh, so that's how you would design your gearbox as well. Uh, you want to um, yeah, make sure that whatever engine, whatever vehicle speed you're at, you're in that kind of region. And obviously we're only producing power at a particular point and then that drops off straight away. So uh, you can kind of see, see straight away that uh, the electric motor characteristics are a lot better suited to traction uh, applications, if you will. So one thing uh, which uh, motor manufacturers like to do, especially in literature as well, if you've ever looked at a motor a technical paper, they love their abbreviations and they love their different configurations that are possible. So with electric motors, we've got a lot of choice. Uh, we've got choice on whether they're AC or DC, uh, actual radial flux, whether they have permanent magnets, there's a long list. So um, essentially that means there's a lot of variation and that means also your electric motors can be designed for a particular application. But, um, but yeah, that means it's uh, essentially up to the manufacturer to design it for a particular application. Um, the synchronous AC motor type is commonly used for traction because uh, there's several reasons. And uh, well, to be fair, this chart really explains it slightly better. Um, so um, DC motors are not normally used for traction simply because of their slightly lower efficiency. Um, but the for traction motors, we a lot of the motors that exist kind of live in this region. So uh, that one over there, where we're essentially we've got a AC motor um, and we've got a synchronous motor as well. So synchronous just basically refers to uh, the fact that the rotor is rotating at the same speed as your electric field um, or magnetic field around a stator. Whereas um, yeah, asynchronous motors essentially lag your um, magnetic field around a stator. But uh, most interesting in this particular case are permanent magnet motors as well. So you've got IPM, SPM motors. You've also got um, yeah, reluctance motors, which are a bit more complicated. But um, yeah, synchronous permanent magnet motors are very often used for traction. Um, the distinction there between IPM and, CERT and SPM is um, one of them is interior, per interior permanent magnet. The other one is a surface mounted permanent magnet. And that essentially is literally just a distinction on how the magnets sit in the rotor, um, which we'll see, in, well, we'll see in a moment. So yeah, um, the main, one of the main reasons why um, PMAC motors or permanent magnet AC motors are so good for traction is because they, the fact that they have permanent magnets in them already means that you don't need to set up or use any current that you're putting in to set up uh, the magnetic field in the rotor. So um, that really just means that you, you are very efficient on your rotor, um, which is obviously what we're after in traction applications. And uh, because we don't need to use any current to generate any, um, any flux in the rotor, we don't really have any I squared R losses either. So that's kind of where the main distinction between induction and um, synchronous, well, asynchronous and synchronous motors lies as well. Um, but uh, in this particular case, uh, the company I work for focuses on actual flux, which um, the, the main two distinctions you've got there is radial and actual, the transverse you can kind of ignore, which um, radial literally just refers to the fact that you're aiming your magnetic flux um, 90 degrees to your axis, to the axis of rotation. Actual flux is more straightforward because that just goes in the same way as your axis of rotation. And that's really the, uh, the main distinction between them. So this, to, this different topology um, means that they're more optimum for uh, different applications. So radial flux is normally long and narrow, and that means it's, uh, it's better for high speed. Um, whereas actual flux are normally better for torque because uh, you can easily get more torque out by extending the radius of the motor itself and your rotor. So, um, so yeah, if you want more customizability, you essentially just make your rotor a bit bigger and add some slightly bigger magnets in. Um, so yeah, the synchronous motors really, that's just the fact that we're rotating the, uh, the rotors at the same speed as the magnetic field around the stator. And then um, an important thing to, well, if you take anything away from this, then 
that's probably the most important, but in PMAC motors, your uh, current through the stator is essentially proportional to the torque that you're producing, whereas the voltage that you're putting in on the phases is, um, is more related to speed. Um, and that's, yeah, that's essentially one of the key factors with, uh, with, with PMAC motors. We'll go into a bit, a bit more detail as to why. Goes ahead. So yeah, don't want to dwell on this too much again, but uh, a very basic um, explanation as to how PMAC motors work. So obviously, I'm pretty sure most of us has done have done A-level physics, where we, um, well, we've learned the fact that essentially we are generating a magnetic field if we pass a current through a wire, and that's literally what an electric motor is doing on a larger scale. So, um, so yeah, you're you're putting current into windings, which are wound around a stator in a particular way. Um, and then when you are putting that current through the windings, that's generating a rotating magnetic field in the stator. And then, so, well, just to be, just to be clear as well, so the, the stator is the part that doesn't move. So the stator is the outside and the rotor is the middle part that spins. So um, with a PMAC magnet, the, uh, sorry, with a PMAC, uh, motor um, our rotor is literally just following the field that you're that you're generating in that stator um, you can obviously have a well very large range of topologies a very common one is three phases so uh, because that already gets you a long way to um, to getting smooth rotation around 360 degrees essentially but uh, you do get motors which are for instance six phase um, but three phases easier to well, conceptually to visualize and also easier to manufacture in a way. So, um, so yeah, we're generating that, uh, the magnetic field in the stator and uh, just by virtue of it being a magnetic field, it obviously, we're obviously uh, attracting and repelling the, mo the magnets in the rotor um, in a certain way. So that's what generates your rotation and also that's what generates your torque. So this is a rough visualization of what that looks like. Um, you're essentially putting in, well, you're driving the, the free phases sinusoidally. So um, yeah, in this particular case with a free phase motor, the, the, um, um, the phase, well, the currents you want to be generating your phases are offset by 120 degrees because uh, well, conceptually, if you split a circle up in 120 degrees, that's how you, that's kind of your optimum uh, separations in terms of the full circle. So uh, if you're splitting up your, um, if you're driving the, um, yeah, the current in that particular way, you're trying to essentially create a resultant uh, rotating vector, which is, um, which is a combination of all of the free phase currents that you're putting into your stator. Um, I'm going to go into a bit more explanation on this into a future lecture, but I think for now, essentially, if you, well, if you get the concept in that we're trying to generate this resultant vector, then that you're a very long way to actually uh, understanding how it works. Because, um, yeah, essentially your individual phase currents, if you go through the maths, um, it kind of works out that you're adding them together in a certain way. But, uh, but yeah, you, that, that kind of resultant phase vector, that's really what we're trying to generate. Because that also, the frequency of this wave, so the speed at which it's, uh, at which it's, traveling uh, determines your rotor speed essentially so uh, if you're yeah if you want to go faster with your motor you want to be putting in a higher frequency of um, of resultant vector and just to give a little bit of an idea on what that looks like in practice so uh, this is again it's convenient that I'm uh, out of work at a motors company because obviously I've got access to all these images um, but yeah so Sayata's motor is a dual rotor uh, motor. So we've got two rotors on each side of the stator. Um, that's just what a cross section looks like. So essentially this whole white part is the part that spins. So these are your rotors. And then that's your axis, that's your shaft, which, is, which comes out the side. Um, so the main, the main bulk of the material is uh, in the coils, <coughs> because obviously they're wound in a particular way to actually, um, well, generate your resultant vector around the um, around the stator and then 
you've got an external extrusion to hold it all in place. You've got laminations in there, which essentially amplify the magnetic field in between of your coils. Um, and then you've got your rotors on both sides, which uh, obviously the thing that generates the torque. So the permanent magnets in this particular case are located on the inside of the state of well, the inside of the rotor there, um, which is probably a bit difficult to see from a distance. But yeah, essentially the magnets sit on the inside face of the rotor on both sides. Um, and then that's all sealed up into a nice package with your three phases coming out the top. So um, yeah, that's uh, what a motor can look like. Obviously, it's not the same for every other type of motor, but uh, just one example. Let's see how we're we doing on time. Yeah, that's all right. So inverters, um, it's a bit more mystery around these. Um, they tend to be a bit more difficult to understand, but um, yeah, not gonna go into any equations or anything like that. So hopefully go into a bit more detail on how they work and it makes sense. Um, so you kind of saw the fact that we're trying to generate uh, free sinusoidal uh, currents, essentially to drive the motor. So it's really a virtue of any motor in that we, uh, we need something to control it because obviously it's highly dependent on, your, on that, the speed of that resultant vector that you're generating. Um, and we need a way to control the power output and the speed output. Tricky part in cars is we can't really store we can't really, well, we don't have a way to get uh, AC current out of anything. Um, you know, if you were to stationary and connected to a grid, you've obviously got AC voltage and current that you can directly tap off. But uh, in a car, you've got, when you're trying to convert your DC current coming from the battery into an AC current. Um, so essentially you're never gonna get away with uh, not having an inverter in there. Um, conceptually, it's quite a simple device, inverters. Um, but uh, obviously in practice, there's quite a lot of limitations and um, yeah, there's, it gets a bit more tricky essentially, but uh, it's still doable. Inverters have been around for quite a long time. Um, so the main uh, inverter type that we're, look, that we're looking at for electric motors are VFDs. So they're variable frequency drives because obviously we're, we're generating uh, sinusoidal waves with a varying uh, resultant uh, frequency. So uh, yeah, that's kind of where that name comes from. So just to put that into a graphical format, so obviously direct current is what comes out of a battery. Um, that's a very, well, it's not quite a misrepresentation, but obviously you can imagine if you're pulling current out of a battery, you're not gonna be able to pull constant current from it at all times, unless you're at a very low current or the continuous current, if you will. But um, so yeah, in reality, that graph will you know, go up and down um, because that's really dictated by your BMS. So the BMS is always calculating um, the actual current that you can supply from your battery. But, um, but yeah, that's essentially what we're trying to do. We're trying to convert a direct current, which is obviously a nice straight line, into three phases, into three sinusoidal currents. So uh, Boas has already shown a few images of this as well. But, uh, but yeah, if you, know, if you see an electric drivetrain and you see a big package with five terminals coming out, you'll recognize as the inverter. Um, obviously come in many different shapes and sizes. Put a few links in if you want to have a look, but uh, yeah, again, it's uh, really the, just the idea on the representation. Um, WRE1 was equipped with a Sevcon inverter, so that's the one in the top right. Uh, that, that particular version is a Gen 4 size 8, so they do them in size 2, size 4, they do them in all sorts of different sizes depending on your actual desired power output. Um, and Sevcons are very popular in terms of uh, motor control because they've, they've, they're quite often used for lifts and fork trucks and all sorts of stuff. But, um, but yeah, the, um, the Silixcon one on the left is an interesting one. That's really a, um, a device designed for e-bikes. So that can obviously get away with a much smaller form factor and air cooling because we're only, I think that's only designed for about six kilowatts peak. So. Uh, yeah, starts to derate itself very quickly. But, uh, but yeah, the more your power, the bigger your box, essentially. And the, I suppose the one other thing to mention on that is the, the inverter's always the most efficient component of your um, drivetrain, um, because it's essentially steady state power electronics, which um, if you 
control them properly, then they're really efficient. Um, and you just kind of the kind of two percent losses really just are your switching losses and your you know kind of um, well your resistances in your circuit. But um, yeah, it's really easy to get a very high efficiency with inverters. So that's uh, again what makes electric powertrains really appealing because the combination of the inverter and motor that obviously results in your total efficiency or your system efficiency. And um, yeah, if the inverter is already at ninety eight percent, then your motor you know, it's also going to be close to that. But uh, you generally see a bit more variation in the motor efficiency, especially at low torque and high speed. Um, but yeah, inverters tend to be quite nice in terms of efficiency. So um, to go into a little bit more detail um, onto inverters, they normally have, uh, well, at least these critical components between them. So there's always a DC link capacitance. So that's kind of the block that's shown in the bottom image. Um, it's not the most obvious representation, but you can also imagine uh, this capacitance essentially being one big capacitor in there. Uh, that DC link capacitance is the thing that smooths your uh, output a lot, because uh, if you can imagine, if we're trying to generate sinusoidal waves, uh, our DC voltage is going to is going to move a lot. Uh, so essentially we use a capacitor uh, and charge it up and discharge it accordingly to try and maintain a very smooth uh, voltage on the output. The other critical component are the half bridges. So they're kind of highlighted in the top diagram with a really crappy box around them. Um, and we can essentially consider each of these, uh, well, each of these components as a single digital output, if you will. So. The, uh, the top image is using MOSFETs to, uh, to generate, well, to, to set up the bridge, and the bottom image is using IGPTs. So it's a very similar component. You can essentially achieve the same result with them. Uh, they're both electronic switches. Um, the one important thing to know about these switches is that they always operated in, uh, in reverse to each other. So if you're driving the top one high, you're always driving the bottom one low. So um, that's always a, a common, uh, well, a common occurrence. Um, so if you're driving the top one high, for instance, then that means you can pass voltage from your DC link into the motor phase. So uh, this particular diagram on the top is a, a good representation of a free phase motor. So that's quite a common depiction in that you've got a inductance on each of the phases, because obviously that inductance is what you get from winding your coil around uh, a stator. Um, the one part missing in the top image is a resistance, because obviously, wherever you're putting current through any wires, you've got a certain bit of internal resistance, um, which ideally wouldn't be there, but you can't get away from it. Um, so the bottom depiction is essentially the same image, but um, this is a bit more detailed. So we can see that internal resistance uh, or the phase resistance component, and also the phase inductance component. and um, Essentially what we're doing, we're joining each of the phases is connected on, on, on one of the sides. So whenever we're putting voltage across a phase, uh, we're driving current through one phase into another phase, essentially. So if we'd imagine that uh, we are, for instance, um, yeah, going from A to B, our voltage is being uh, delivered from the top, goes through this switch when it's closed, goes onto the phase, goes through the neutral point and out for instance, phase B or phase C back to ground. So that's kind of, you're essentially switching these in sequence to generate your sinusoidal waves. Um, let's see what else. So yeah, the important thing is the gate drivers. So uh, the gate drivers is, are essentially the things that are switching these components on and off. So that would essentially be connected to your drives there. Um, they have to be isolated in any inverter because your high voltage, you always want to be isolated from your control voltage or your low voltage. Um, so that's another key feature of them. Um, and then you always have a form of microprocessor in there, whether that's a, um, you know, an ARM chip or a, or a Texas chip or whatever. Um, yeah, you've got a form of microprocessor on there, which is doing all of the monitoring and the control. So inverters are quite clever devices. Um, they've got a lot of sensors on them. 
because as you can imagine, if you're trying to generate this, these free sinusoidal curves, uh, you need to measure quite a lot of things. So um, for example, you need to measure the current going through the phases. So uh, on the vertex, you can get away with just measuring the current going through two phases. But, um, but yeah, you can always get these measurements straight from the inverter. So uh, every inverter tends to kind of have a, uh, a GUI or an interface where you can, you can plug into and you can read out, for instance, error diagnostics or live readings of, you know, the phase voltages or the currents or whatever you want, really. Um, so that's, that's quite useful for debugging because obviously uh, the tricky part is if you're trying to do such a complex task, all of your parameters need to be correct uh, for it to work. So uh, one small change in a parameter can cause the device to stop working. Um, they're quite clever in terms of protection as well. So you can set, you know, over, over temperature, over current limits, over voltage limits. You can basically configure it as to what your drive tain is doing, um, which really helps in terms of, you know, making sure that your batteries don't uh, catch fire. So, a um, yeah, I'm not sure whether, if I say pulse width modulation, does anyone recognize that term? What is it? Yeah, okay. What's the basic explanation? So essentially, as opposed to just resisting the current, you can periodically take the current away so that over a certain amount of time with very quick pulses, uh, the current will drop. So you could have, um, well, however quick you want to do it, for yep. example, either the whole phase or half the phase or however much you want, periodically remove or add current um, on and off so that it happens without some more or less. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's essentially what we're trying to do. So um, I don't know whether that was all meant to come at once, but yes, it was. <laughs> so pulse width modulation, as, uh, as Cole described, we're essentially trying to generate an average voltage or any voltage from a digital output. So a digital signal is limited in that it's only got a, you know, it's, well, it's only got two states. So you've got on the digital signal, you've got your five volt output and your zero volts. Obviously that, that number is arbitrary. It can be 12 volts, can be 24 volts, whatever. But you've always got those two states. Um, essentially what we're trying to do with pulse and modulation is we're trying to um, emulate or switch this in such a way that we can generate any voltage we want. Because obviously uh, if we're trying to generate a, a sinusoid, we don't just want to be able to switch on five volts because you want to be able to get all of your voltages in between. So if you, um, the way we can do this is by switching on and off very quickly. So if you, if you uh, switch the output on for a very small period of time, so imagine we've got a fixed fixing fre uh, switching frequency. So we're uh, essentially generating a, a square wave, if you will. Um, if you have that output on for a very low proportion of that period, that means that your average voltage across that period is going to be lower than your five volts. And the same works the other way around. If you are, if you have your um, your your voltage or your output switched on for a large proportion of the period, that means your average voltage is going to be high. Um, so in this particular case, if we just had the output always enabled, that would give us a, uh, well, the, the maximum output voltage, essentially. So five volts in this case, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's essentially the idea. So we're trying to switch to keep the, uh, switching on times and the off times variable. And then we're also switching the period at which we're switching because, uh, as you can imagine, we need to do that switching very quickly because otherwise we're just uh, generating square, square waves and that doesn't really help anyone. So our switching frequency or that time period of T needs to be high essentially um, to get a smooth output voltage. So um, a common concept to, um, yeah, to, well, to refer to that is called the duty cycle. So uh, in this particular case, if we have a digital output of 10 volts, maximum and zero volts off. Um, if we have a five, well, sorry, a 50% duty cycle, we get a five volt average voltage across that period because obviously we switched on for half of the time and off half of the time. And the same works for any duty cycle between those two values. So um, yeah, if we're not on for very long, 
our duty cycle is 25% or low, and we're generating two and a half volts average across that period. Um, that is essentially what you're trying to do. So you're switching on and off very rapidly to generate that sine wave. So um, at the peak points in the sine wave, you can see the duty cycle is very high. So we nearly have no time where we're off, essentially. And the, well, the, the inverse is true at the negative points of that sine wave. So at the zero volt region, we are essentially, um, our on period is virtually zero because obviously we're trying to generate zero volts. Um, and then at any point in between of there, you can see we're kind of switching the duty cycle and we're switching the, that, that period. Um, the period norms normally stays constant, but in this, in this particular image, it, it is variable. So that's a bit confusing, but yeah, normally you are switching at a constant uh, frequency. Um, and uh, yeah, that's essentially what you're doing with inverters. So you are essentially trying to do this for three phases. Um, and uh, yeah, if you can get your head around that, then uh, you've pretty much got the concept of inverters. Um, I suppose the one thing to notice is uh, we do need to, because we've got this very high frequency signal on the output, we do normally need to filter this out. So uh, normally our resultant sine wave, uh, say in this case of, you know, of one kilohertz, is a lot higher in, sorry, a lot lower in frequencies com compared to the switching frequency. So you normally have a, in this particular case, you'd have a low pass filter on there to, for instance, cut off that five kilohertz or 10 kilohertz to make sure that you don't get any of that high frequency noise in your uh, output signal. That smooths it out even more. So just to put that into um, slightly, I don't know if this is clearer or not, but we'll see. Uh, so yeah, so each of these, each of these bridges, each of these half bridges can be considered to be a digital signal. So essentially our first half bridge is one digital output and the other two are the same thing. And uh, yeah, once we've, we've got that, well, we, once we've got those digital outputs, if you will, uh, we can put them together and we can perform PWM with each of those to generate those free sine waves, which is a very hand wavy explanation, but uh, that's the core concept behind it really. Um, it's not too much magic in there. Uh, really. So again, this is uh, yeah, this this is what's we can kind of see that we're uh, generating those free sinusoids, um, and because they're space, you've got that 120 degree spacing around them, you get your uh, smooth rotation in the output vector. So uh, this is kind of also where we can see that the if we have higher phase currents, uh, we are essentially generating more, well, we're putting more current through the phases, and then we're also, as a result, generating a higher magnetic field, um, which is causing more pull on the rotor. So that's why our torque increases, and as a result of that power, because obviously power is just torque times speed. Um, and yeah, the higher the frequency, the faster the, the motor speed, which I've uh, already mentioned. But, uh, but yeah, we'll go into a bit more detail on this on the future uh, presentations. But hopefully that's given a bit of an idea of, as to what's going on behind the scenes. So, uh, let's see how we're doing. Yeah, getting on. But Okay, so just quickly then, uh, the vehicle control unit, that's really the thing that's doing all of the clever stuff in a way. Um, in the same way as an IC car, you need something that essentially makes sure that all of your components talk to each other. Um, so for electric vehicles, this is your VCU. Um, I've put a few functions on there on the board, but um, yeah, you can imagine anything complicated um, the VCU is essentially doing. One of the most important things, it's, it's, it's watching for, um, well, essentially, constantly monitoring your BMS and your inverter um, and just making sure that you're not going into error state because obviously if you do go into an error state then you need to have a controlled shutdown of, um, of the whole system. Um, so it's the safety part is really quite critical in VCUs so obviously when you're doing any coding or when you're setting up the, the actual architecture uh, that's um, 
yeah, you have to really think about catching all of your possible failure modes. Um, another really important thing that the VCU is doing is it's handling the user input and output. So, uh, you know, it's taking your pedal request, for instance, if you're saying that you want to go full torque, uh, the inverter then looks at the output from the BMS and says, is that possible? If it's not, then it will derate, derate the torque request uh, and then also send that torque demand to the inverter. So, um, you know, the torque can be derated on temperature or BMS conditions or uh, there's quite a few other things which can cause a derate, for instance, low state of charge. But, um, but yeah, your VCU is essentially taking care of all of that in addition to things like, you know, driving cooling pumps and uh, and also a key one is the drivability of it because obviously, um, well, for our particular car, it's fine to just have a pedal which if you fully press in, you instantly go. But in a passenger car with um, all the torque available from an electric motor, you probably want to um, filter your pedal inputs quite carefully because you don't want your general consumers, you know, putting the pedal down to the floor and spinning away. So uh, there's quite a bit that goes on behind the scenes to do with drivability as well, which is quite a big topic. Um, and it's obviously custom to every vehicle that, that, uh, that, that is manufactured. So yeah, uh, at its core, a VCU is again, a microcontroller, very useful things. Um, one of the key uh, parts about that is that it needs a very fast clock speed because uh, especially safety, uh, safety systems kind of have to evaluate the system at a very high frequency um, and you need to be able to essentially handle interrupts very quickly. Um, so normally you get a pretty high clock speed on, uh, on microprocessors. There's debate as to whether 100 megahertz is fast or not, but that's a pretty good benchmark, especially with, in terms of uh, passenger, well, consumer vehicles. Um, and obviously this microcontroller has to have, you know, analog inputs, digital inputs, uh, digital outputs, PWM outputs. A very common thing is also a CAN bus. So um, that probably is familiar to a lot of you, but it's essentially just a way to, um, to transfer a lot of information on two wires um, very quickly. And, you know, or sometimes you get additional extras like an ethernet port if you want to do debugging, but um, on the standard passenger vehicle, you probably wouldn't um, simply because that's all been taken out in the design, uh, the kind of ready for production phase, if you will. Um, so this is one example of it. And that's what we've used for the, well, for WV1. Um, that's called the Teensy. That's a very capable microcontroller, which is obviously the chip in the middle there of the picture. Um, that's probably, well, it's obviously one of the more basic ways to do it. Um, and that is, no, well, that particular one was programmed in a combination of Arduino and C++. Um, but uh, these days there's obviously a lot, well, there's a lot of, a lot of different options available. Um, nice thing about the teams is that it is very capable for what we're trying to do with it. So, uh, and it's also got two integrated CAN buses on, uh, well, CAN transceivers. I think it's actually free, isn't it? It's free, free CAN transceivers on there. Um, so that's very useful. Um, slightly higher level up is an embed E400. Again, these are just examples, but uh, that particular unit is um, normally coded in Simulink. So that's a bit more like what you would have in a production vehicle uh, because Simulink is a bit, it's a bit more annoying to work with, uh, but it's also easier to catch basic errors. So um, something like Simulink is a bit more common for production. And obviously you get nice features with that where it's, you know, you get your waterproof enclosure, you get your shockproof mounting, that kind of thing. And then uh, at the very high end of the scale, we've obviously got Bosch units, um, which yeah, do what they say on the tin. They, uh, that particular one is designed for ISO 26262, which is really quite a stringent safety standard. Um, and there's, all, there's different levels at which you can comply to that. But uh, if you do go into industry and head into EVs, then that's probably a term you'll see quite a lot of. Um, yeah, you essentially have to do things like put two microprocessors in just in case one breaks. Um, it gets quite uh, hairy, but, uh, but yeah, you can imagine the price tag obviously goes up with down to scale um, what's on the board. So let's see a state machine. Does anyone know what a state machine is? 
Go on, Mabuba. You know you want to. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> Go on. Exactly. It's a very fancy word to describe something that makes a lot of common sense. Um, essentially, if we think about an EV, we've got several operational modes that we can be in. So, uh, you know, if you well, if we uh, if we consider an EV just to sit there on the floor, obviously we want to start it up in a particular state. In that state, we probably want to do some error checking because we don't straight away want to you know be able to drive away because that would just be stupid. Um, so essentially, that's what a state machine is. It's just putting blocks of code in, in that logical format. So um, this is a very, well, it's actually pretty close to what was on WE1 in terms of states. I'm not sure how visible that is at the back, but, uh, but yeah, this, um, this block here, these kind of six bubbles, if you will, that's essentially each of them is a particular state. So, uh, and then that block of states, the, the block of six, uh, is essentially your initialization sequence. So uh, you can see we kind of pass through several different states on startup because of what we're trying to check. So uh, at initial power on, we want to close the contactors and talk to the BMS to see whether we actually can close the contactors. Um, if we can't close the contactors, then we've got the option of, well, the only option that we can do is go into an error state. So uh, that's the other thing to note with state machine diagrams is that the arrow, the, the directionality of the arrows is quite important. So uh, in this particular case, if we're only going one way, we can't go back onto the same path um, if there's no two arrows. But, uh, but yeah, in this particular case, if we close the contactors and the BMS is fine to do so, we will close the contactors. Um, if, that's, if that's happened, then we will wait for a pre-charge to occur, which uh, not sure how many of you are familiar with pre-charge, but that's essentially where you're, because you've got such a big DC link capacitance on your inverter, you don't want to put all of your current in at once. So you want to put a small amount of current to start with until your capacitor is charged up to a certain voltage, because um, that essentially decreases the voltage differential. Um, and then that also means that you get less of a spike on the input current. So yeah, we wait for the pre-charge to complete and uh, we obviously allow us to, pr to progress once that DC link capacitance is at a certain uh, threshold. Um, yeah, so then once we've taken care of the battery, once we're happy with the battery and that's fine, we can then look at starting the inverter. So the inverter needs a particular operational state. So uh, in, a lot of the, in a lot of the time, this is just a control word and um, it might be a few additional messages. Normally it's sent over CAN, but essentially we send the inverter those messages and we try and get the inverter operational. Um, we check to see whether there's any errors on the inverter before proceeding. If there's any errors, then obviously we go into the error state. And uh, if we do get into the error state, we have to go back through the start of the sequence. So um, given we're not into error, we want to set a zero Newton meter demand because obviously we don't want to race away uh, without any uh, control if we're not pressing a pedal. Um, and then if that's all fine, we're gonna sound a buzzer and then essentially win the driving state. Um, in the driving state, we're continuously checking for errors, either with the uh, BMS or the uh, or the inverter. And um, yeah, if we do ever reach an error, then we instantly go into that error state, and which uh, well, which essentially puts you in a safe mode. Um, so that's really what the state machine is doing. So it's really um, yeah, it's organizing your actual system into blocks, which uh, which well, correspond to an actual function uh, in the real world. So in this particular case, we've got that initialization, we've got the driving state, stop state is a bit questionable, but the error state is obviously a must have. So um, yeah, ideally we'd spend most of the time in the driving state, because obviously that's where we're moving and that's what we care about. Um, the state machine has to be updated very quickly. So I put 100, 200 milliseconds on there, but that's probably too fast. Well, it's probably too slow actually. Um, probably want to do that a bit more quickly on an actual vehicle. Um, and yeah, essentially you're going through your state machine with um, conditional logic in code. So yeah, that's what a state machine is. Um, and yeah, I've kind of covered this already. It's kind of a redundant slide really. But, uh, but yeah, the uh, 
VCU is just looking constantly looking at your inputs and uh, generating user outputs as a result. So uh, the key thing it's doing is generating that torque demand that is sent to the inverter. Um, yeah, which can be negative if your officer got regen enabled. So um, something which I probably wasn't going to put in, but might as well cover it quickly. Um, but in a so really just to give an idea on how much impact the system voltage has on your system. Um, so from a functional perspective, we'd probably want, you know, to have a DC link voltage as high as possible, right? Mainly because, well, at very, very high voltage, if you're generating a certain amount of power, that means you need less uh, current to deliver that power, which is conceptually a good thing because obviously current means heat and power drops across resistances. So uh, ideally you'd have that current as low as possible um, because you can get quite a few benefits from having a lower current in a lot of cases. Um, another good thing is that uh, the voltage, uh, well, the voltage that's on your phases is, well, it's pretty much a direct um, result in how fast you can spin on the motor which kind of alludes to the same point that I made a few slides ago, um, in which case you essentially extend your usable RPM range. So you've got your peak torque available for a longer um, period of time. And that means uh, you can operate at that peak torque for, yeah, for, for a bigger period. So that's obviously good because we don't need to go into field weakening, which is into the constant power region. And that means we can get a higher efficiency out. Um, the also, the good thing is that the battery current then during charging isn't the limiting factor anymore. So that means that you can potentially um, increase the charging power. But uh, that's obviously at discretion of the system designer. To put a few points against that, um, obviously if we're running at a higher voltage, that means we need to be more careful about how we design a battery pack because higher voltage can, uh, if you think about capacitors, essentially the higher your voltage, the higher an air, back, air gap that voltage could jump to. So you need to be a lot more careful with how you design your insulation in the battery. And, um, you know, you could say that that's probably going to increase the volume of your battery uh, unless you design it with good materials. Um, the other thing is the leakage currents also increase. So because, you're, uh, because your system is isolated and uh, you have a potential difference uh, from your DC link to your chassis, you get higher leakage current, which is a bit dangerous because obviously there's a certain level of leakage current you can accept, but um, yeah, that is limited for safety. Um, another thing is, well, up to about a kilovolt, you've got reasonable choices, but uh, any more than that means that you're going to be looking at specialist components, probably in a similar realm to what trains are using, that kind of thing. So obviously that becomes much higher cost. So um, yeah, the other thing is core safety. Um, the higher your voltage, the more dangerous it is to work on it in case someone does drop a spanner on any terminals. And uh, there's a few other points. So, uh, so yeah, you can see it's not just as easy as uh, saying we want the highest possible DC link voltage because that's, that's the one parameter really which is um, having an effect on the whole system. So a very common voltage is 600 volts, 800 volts, 400 is starting to probably get less popular, but it's still it's still common as well, to be fair. But uh, but yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think that's uh, the end. I don't know whether we need to do anything special with that PDR point thing, but if anyone does have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If not, we can also all go home and. Uh, Think about the waste of time that we've had today. But uh, yeah, don't know. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs>